Happy, happy New Year, Rotarians. <laughs> I'll step away for a second. The, uh, I hope everyone had, a, had great holidays, a, uh, a nice Christmas. Um, somebody asked me what I got for Christmas, and I just told them I got fat, just uh, the, uh, for whatever it's worth. I hope all of you had a cup of kindness. My New Year was great. No police this year involved. Just... Uh, Today we're going to have a great program. It's uh, our speaker today is from the refinery. You'll hear all about my goodchen in a moment. Uh, as we get started, as normal, can we have Mike George come to the podium and give us the reflection? And then Kathy, would you give the pledge of allegiance? Let us pray. Dear God, as we begin a new year, let us be mindful of all your abundant gifts the gift of science, which allows us to live lives previously thought impossible, the gift of education, which illuminates the darkest corners of our minds and lets us make dreams realities, the gift of work, the ability to pursue the careers of our choosing and impact those around us, the gift of connections, allowing us to be individuals, yet knowing the power we have as Rotarians when we connect to change the world, and perhaps most importantly, the gift of love and your never-ending mercy. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our sponsor for this month is Spartan Chemical. Thank you very much to Spartan Chemical for that. Dylan Orwig, would you come to the floor mic and introduce visiting Rotarians? President Tim, we have one visiting Rotarian today. Visiting Rotarian, please stand as I read your name and remain standing until President Tim welcomes you. Uh, we have with us Glenn Carlson from the Sylvania uh, Rotary. President Tim, these are our visiting Rotarians. Welcome, Glenn. I hope you enjoy the meeting today. Max Reddish, where are you? I think I saw you out there. What am I doing? Ah, excuse me. Max Reddish, just stay there. Can I, I would like to invite uh, members who have brought guests Tim, today. Yep, thank you. Um, I have a guest with me today. Good morning, President Tim and fellow Rotarians. I brought the new general manager of the Toledo Area Regional Transit Authority with me, Kimberly Dunham. Wow. Kimberly, I, I don't normally do this, but did I just hear that you're the new general manager for TARTA? Yes, you did. Do you know that you're a very important person in this community and we really want you to be successful? You humble me very much. It is my greatest pleasure to be here in this community and to, I understand the challenges we have at TARTA, but I know how incredibly important our service is for economic development, access to jobs, workforce development, and I came here purposely to work very hard to transform TARTA, so I appreciate all of your assistance very much. Thank you very much. Okay, Max, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm here to inform everybody that there's been some renewed interest in a Euchre tournament every month. So Shireen Morad and I have gotten together and organized one coming up this Monday. Um, and then every following month, it'll be on the second Monday of every month. Uh, it's a $5 buy-in, and uh, each individual person plays for themselves. Uh, it's two rounds of cards per table for two hours, starting at 7 p.m. And uh, the winner takes home the pot at the end of the night. Um, if you have any questions or you're interested in playing with us, we just want to play some cards. So you can contact myself or Shireen for more information. Okay, so this is a game of chance you're talking about? <clears throat> this is a game of skill, President Tim. Okay, so I, it, it, and it's called Euchre, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, and where are you going to do this at? This will be at the Toledo Club, 14th Street, downtown Toledo. Okay, aside from the $5 buy-in, is there any other expense? Uh, well, there'll be a cash bar. I think Shireen's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so it'll be on uh, the main level of the Toledo Club in the Red Room, and adjacent to that room is the Oak Bar, uh, and there will be a bartender on staff. 
Uh, watch out for the club pours. They'll get you. And it starts at what time? Uh, 7 o'clock. Thank you very much, Max. Thank you. I'm betting Shireen is out there, Shireen Barard, and she's got a big smile. You must have had a nice New Year, I hope. I did. Did everybody have a good New Year? Happy New Year, everybody. Thanks for being here. It looks like we have a lot of people here today. Um, just a membership update for you. So we have 15 new members. So I want to congratulate everybody and thank everybody for all your continued efforts to help us as a club join together because we can't do this alone. So each of you are a part of our journey to get more members. Um, so we just want to recap of the power of one. So it was created basically to make it easy so that we can get new members and no one feels a lot of pressure. So if each person just brings one person onto the Rotary this year, then we will hit our goal double, triple. We, our goal is only 70 and we have 15. So we have a long way to go, but we have a short amount of time to get there. So that means I need each and every one of you to really help us and I'm thank, so thankful that you guys are all doing your best and I know everyone's bringing guests. The Park Inn has allowed us to have a free lunch for anyone that brings guests so I'm very appreciative of everyone that does that and take take advantage of that. We doesn't matter who you bring as long as you bring somebody that you think is going to be a good fit for the club. Um, I'm going over my notes. You know, I guys, I'm very nervous. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, there is two people, are probably 150 people in this room. So if everybody just joins together, I think that we will we'll do a really good job. Um, we can bring people to the Euchre Night at the Toledo Club because it's a member and a guest opportunity for us. So we will have um, opportunity to have glass of wine or a Coke um, available, and then we're also going to provide snacks for you as well. So this again on Monday, next Monday at 6 p.m. at the Toledo Club uh, at the Red Room. And then we're also going to have a meeting today for new member at 1 o'clock. So if anybody wants to join us and kind of get a behind scenes look of what our, our the rest of our calendar looks like and how we can bring more members on board or if you guys have any ideas, I would love to hear them. So we will hear you at 1 o'clock today in the Cape Room. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Just, <laughs> okay, so this again is at the Toledo Club. Yes. It starts at? 6. If, uh, 6, 7. 5.30. Can you sort that out with Max? I'm sorry? What time does it start? I don't know. Six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Seven o'clock. So I was going to, okay. Hey, Mike, what time does it start? Sorry. Seven o'clock. Seven okay. o'clock. Okay. Seven o'clock. Everyone so here if, 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 uh, if I'm still together with my partner, can I bring her? So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, yes. Bring your partner, bring your friend, colleague, okay. anybody that would join Rotary. Okay. And what's this Power of One stuff? So Power of One was created so that each of you guys would have the opportunity to not feel pressure and bring one person on board to Rotary. So you want everybody sitting at this table yes. to find a friend? Yes. Do you think perhaps what the problem is is these guys don't have friends? That's okay. You guys all work with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> or do charity events with somebody. Or find somebody on the street corner as long as they're <laughs> going to be a good fit for Rotary. Okay, that's the goal, is to be a good fit for Rotary. Thank you very much, Shereen. <laughs> Kathy told me a few days ago that I am half done in terms of this Rotary year. I have to say, pardon me? Oh, she said it in a better way than that, but that's what she meant. And. Uh, and then we started talking about all of the things that this club has accomplished. And I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. And I'm not going to go through, going to spend much time on it, but it didn't take long to fill up a piece of paper uh, with all of the stuff that this club and all of the committees do. You know, whether it's, and I'm just going to go through a list. It'll be very quick. I don't want to spend too much time on it. But Axel Polio, collecting school supplies. You guys remember doing that. Assembling bikes. 
for children that need it. Uh, kids attending first day of class at uh, Martin Luther King Academy where we had Rotarians stand up and shake hands with these sixth graders as they walked in. The press conferences that we had for lead testing, the holiday party, the euchre that, is, that took place last year but is being planned right now. Bowling, which I'm told is a lot of fun, I've got to do it sometime. The 1912 Fellowship that we set up, uh, welcoming the incoming exchange students, the radio interviews, the television interviews that we've done. Uh, we brought on a professional photographer to record what we were doing to help us uh, get our message across for advocacy. The, I'm sorry I'm just reading from this list, but the foundation presentations that you've heard, the grant presentations that we do pretty much weekly, uh, getting chairs up to the podium. I, perhaps all of you don't know that we had the Sierra Lincoln ambassador come by and ask to meet with us to thank us for saving so many lives at Sierra Lanka this year. The uh, continuing flu, the continuing work with the three transformational projects that this club should be very proud of: pre-K, clean water, and lead abatement. We continue as advocates. The Mesa program and bike uh, riding is, is being planned right now. We've done a club assembly. I could go on and on, but this club does a lot, and that's part of the reason I, I am so proud to be part of it. You can applaud yourselves for that one. <laughs> There's a guy out there, what's his name? Eric, Eric, what's Eric's last name? What's Eric's last name? Oh. Eric Fankhauser, are you out there somewhere? Would you go to the floor mic, please? Am I in trouble? Yes, okay, so. I'm told your name is Eric, and how do you pronounce that last name? Uh, most people say Fankhauser, but some people say Funkhauser. If you want to <laughs> feel like you're speaking a little German, you do can you say have a preference? Funkhauser. Either one's fine. Okay, well that's good. It, get, but it gets butchered up a lot. Is it true that you're a uh, past president of this club? It is. How long ago was that? In the olden days? <laughs> 2010 and 11. 2010, 11, I followed okay. past President Brad Rubini and I preceded past President Gary McBride. Did you like those guys? That's great. The, yeah, they're both awesome guys. Okay, that's good to know. How long have you been in Rotary? Uh, I joined one as a baby about 26 years ago. <laughs> wow. Why did you join? Um, I joined because I wanted to make a difference in the community, be surrounded by like-minded people, network, and it just fulfilled um, a community responsibility, I, I think. Do you feel you've been successful in making a difference in the community? Very much so, yes. Okay. Do you know everybody in this room? No, I don't. That's a problem, isn't it? It is. Yeah, you're, you're a decent man. The, uh, have you got a 30-second elevator speech about why you're in Rotary? Well, the Rotary Club of Toledo was established in 1912, we're the 44th club that was established since the beginning of Rotary International. We are about the 10th largest club in the entire world of almost 32,000 clubs. And it's an organization that is filled with like-minded people that want to make a difference in the community and in the world. 28 seconds. There you go. All right. Eric, did you have anything to do with the uh, uh, other trust uh, um, trustees of the foundation in putting together this 1912 organization? We, yeah, we worked hard on that. We, we talked about it quite a bit. And uh, are you the guy that named it? Um, I, I came up with the idea and we discussed it as a group, yes. Okay, so it's called the 1912 Fellow Award? Mm-hmm. 1912 Society, I think. And do you know how many people have contributed to that so far? Um, probably 23 to 25, maybe. I think the number is 32. Okay. And it's been amazingly successful in terms of make, providing funds to make changes, positive changes to our community. And because of that, I said to 
Kathy? <laughs> that we should recognize somebody from the uh, uh, trustees, somebody who did something like name it, somebody that we kind of like. And uh, when was the last time you received a gold star? Probably in second grade. Okay, so we are, uh, we are giving you, for all of your work that you've done for all of these years, we will awesome. give you a brand new gold star. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Steve Miller, would you come to the podium? Well, Happy New Year, everybody. It's time to talk again about the foundation. We are on our way to uh, meeting our goal, I hope. We are at 43% of Rotarians who have donated so far through December 31st. I have the list right here. So hopefully we're going to add you to this list if you're not on it. Wanted to talk just briefly. At Tim Tim, President Tim kind of stole my thunder a little bit, but wanted to talk just briefly about the levels of Rotary. There, there is the Paul Harris Fellow, which is a $1,000 donation to the Rotary International Foundation. There's a 1912 Fellow, which Tim just mentioned, which is a donation to our local Toledo Rotary Foundation. And then if you contribute uh, $250 within the calendar year, which, by the way, the calendar year for Rotary is July 1st to June 30th, then you're in the President's Club. We're looking for uh, any contributions, whether it's $10, $100, $250, $1,000. We want to keep the, the grants going uh, that we've been able to do over these, these past years to do this. Uh, Greg Steenrod, my, my fellow campaign chairman, uh, is not able to be here today. But if you recall, it's been in the spoke, if you've been reading the spoke, that if we meet our goal to get to 80%, right? Did I say that right? Yeah, 80%. Uh, of people to donate to the foundation that uh, I'm donating four tickets to your event of choice to the Huntington Center and Greg Steenrod is going to donate uh, a trip to Sunnybrook Farms to go trout fishing so hopefully you will consider making a donation at any amount to the foundation the deadline to do that is by the February 3rd meeting which is one month from today so hopefully you'll consider doing that and make your contribution for the Rotary Foundation thanks Thank you, Steve. All of the good work that Eric did, could he have done it without the foundation? We do a lot. We give away a couple hundred grand every year to the community, and we can't do it without your help. Sharon Skilleter, would you come to the podium? Thank you, President Tim, and thank you for not having 100 questions for me, too. I feel like I need a number on my chest or something here. <laughs> but anyway, on behalf of the Toledo Rotary Club Foundation, it's my pleasure today to present a grant check in the amount of $9,571 to Unruly Arts. This grant is providing funding for the Kiln Project. This, this grant was uh, done by our Vocational Services Committees members they received the grant they participated in the vetting process and made the decision to recommend the grant approval to your club board and foundation trustees and this is a great segue into what steve was just talking about and tim was talking about we couldn't give these type of um these type of uh, funding out in the community if each and every one of you did not participate and even if it's it's ten dollars a year it is, it is participation but it, thank you to those who do participate because it's due to your unselfishness which enables us to continue to give these grants thank you to everyone who continues to support our Toledo Rotary Club Foundation so we can continue in the aid in supporting the needs of our community at this time I'd like to invite Joan Brown Coase, who is the board chairman of Unruly Arts, to come to the podium to accept the grant and share a short description of how the foundation's grant of $9,571 will help their organization. Thank you.
Well, I'd like to, on behalf of the board and Lori Schoen, who is the heart and soul and brains of Unruly Arts and all of the artists and volunteers, um, I'd like to uh, express our sincere and deep appreciation for this um, award. Unruly Arts, we have just finished our third year um, in December, and we are an inclusive art studio but our focus is um, providing a um, supportive and fun environment um, primarily for individuals with disabilities. We um, uh, accept no, or we don't receive, not we would accept it, but we uh, do not receive government funds. And so we um, exist pretty much on either the sales of the, the work that the artists produce. Uh, we split the, the proceeds with the artists and on donations such as this. So we used this money to buy two kilns. We bought a clay kiln and we bought a glass kiln. And for those of you that haven't heard of us or don't know where we're located, we are in the artist village at uh, TBG, the Botanical Gardens. So by um, having receiving the money to be able to buy these kilns, we were able to give our artists exposure to uh, two new mediums that we hadn't been able to do before. We didn't have the space or the, the materials. And it also increased our sales significantly this year. I'm happy to say we're in the black uh, this year, which is really wonderful. And a big reason for that is the generosity of your check. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Do we have a check here? I think it's back here. No, it's a big one. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> we'll sort that out. I'm wondering who in this room had anything to do with the vetting process for this, uh, this gift? I know, Kirk, I know you were. Anybody else who was involved in it? We're bashful people here today. Bob Savage, would you like to introduce our speaker today? Sure. Okay, come on up. First, just a short chime in to a part of Steve's message here, and maybe a little bit of Tim's. We, before those of on the program committee, we just met before here, and uh, we've had a number of excellent programs recently. Uh, Walt, you helped with one, along with with Dick and Clint, that have received outstanding ratings, and wasn't the only one to receive outstanding ratings. But somebody in this club gave you guys only a three out of five. And they said, I thought it was a great program, but as long as we had such a good program, we should have asked people to give more money. And uh, which obviously that, that's part of how we help. But here today, I'm, I'm here to introduce um, Mike Gudgeon. And um, many of you may know, but some, many of you may not, that refinery is actually one of the largest industries in the Toledo area. It's absolutely in the top four or five. I haven't heard it's at number three. I probably believe that, that that's the case. Um, Mike is the COO of the Toledo Refining Company here, and COO is the number one spot here in the, in the region. Um, maybe a little bit quietly, they are one of Toledo's largest and oldest operating companies uh, in the area. Mike actually grew up in Greater London. He studied at the University of Birmingham. He has masters in chemical and biochemical engineering. And after uh, some stints in the chemical industries, one of which brought him to Virginia, uh, he has then been in the refining business, has worked for BP Amico and Valero, and has then joined PBF Energy, which owns Toledo Refining. The, uh, the B in PBF stands for Blackstone, so it's a fairly large group, but bigger than, bigger than I knew, certainly. Um, and um, Mike has, has been at, at TRC now for a while, he is responsible for all aspects of the operation, including reporting to Homeland Security and the Department of Energy. They employ over 700 people directly, and many more indirectly, and that's, and even more during an upgrade 
or, uh, or maintenance change, and they process 170,000 barrels of crude, ev crude, oil, crude oil every day. Mike and his wife and two children live in Perrysburg, and let's extend a warm rotary welcome to Mike Gudgeon. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Bob, for that great introduction. I really appreciate it, and, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to kind of talk to a group like this in Toledo. Um, every opportunity I get, I, I take, so, you know, I am available for birthdays and whatever. <laughs> but seriously, when I get to the end of this presentation, I think you'll understand why. And I think you'll understand why I jumped at the opportunity to talk to, to Rotary uh, as it relates to the company that I run and, and the kind of values that we, we have. I think quite a lot in common, so I think that'll be interesting. So again, thank you for the invite. So um, before I get going, le less than 24 hours ago, uh, at the Golden Globes, they put a British guy in front of an audience and let him say whatever he wanted to. <laughs> you nervous, Bob? <laughs> Should be. No, 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 no. It's going to be very different. So uh, I'm going to do one thing that I don't normally do. I'm actually going to read from a piece of paper. Whenever I do presentations, I very rarely do that. I, I, I much prefer the interaction and just kind of ad-libbing and having a bit of fun. Uh, but I'm actually going to read something because it's something I wrote, uh, and, and you'll understand why in a minute. But uh, give you a little bit of intro. So one of the things that I do as, as refinery manager uh, is I host uh, retiree meetings, luncheons and Christmas stuff. Uh, and, and these are meetings where all the retirees from the refinery uh, that, that are still in Toledo get together as a group uh, and, and you know, enjoy some fellowship and have some food and we, we provide little gifts and, and have a lot of fun. And, and there's folks there that started their career at this refinery uh, just across the river here, you know, maybe in the 60s. So you have folks in that room going back, you know, a generation or even two generations. And you start to get a sense of the legacy of, of this kind of facility, the people that work there and, and the kind of things they went through and so on. And you talk to them and they say, oh, yeah, you know, when I joined, uh, there was people there that were started work at the refinery in the 20s and the 30s. And, you know, and you start to see this kind of lineage going back in time. And, and it got me thinking about how long this facility has been in Toledo. It's actually been here um, for 125 years this year. This is our 125th anniversary, which is amazing for a, a single industry in a single location doing the same thing day after day for 125 years without a break. And I, th I think it's that, that's worth celebrating. I think it's, you know, you've got generations of families that were supported by the jobs this thing created and, and a solid tax base for the, for the city. And, and, you know, I can go on and on. But it, it's very much worth celebrating and probably more so because of the people and the legacy that they've left for, for others to, uh, to pick up. So um, what that did, that inspired me to look at the history of this facility and say, okay, what actually happened in the 125 years we've been here? So I'm going to read a history that I wrote for a, uh, and actually for a newsletter that goes to all the refinery employees and other folks in the community. I'm going to read this, uh, and then I'm, at the end of it, I'm going to talk more generally about the company that I work for now and, and kind of some of our values and some of the things we do within the community. So um, with that, we're going to start the presentation. Okay. Let me get this thing going. There we go. So, in 1859, in Western Pennsylvania, a guy called Edwin Drake pioneered a method for extracting oil from the ground using a novel drilling technique. This was the birth of the modern oil industry, and this was just across the Pennsylvania border. Soon this area of the country became a center for huge growth and prosperity. This attracted a farmer's son, Joseph Pugh, from Mercer County, Pennsylvania, who had already dabbled in real estate and soon added oil leases to his business portfolio. His initial venture into the oil industry failed, but he persevered and in 1877, he invented a novel way to cap oil wells and recover the natural gas. And so what he did 
is he found a way to capture the natural gas and put it in a pipe and ended up sending it to Pittsburgh, which spurned the steelmaking industry in Pittsburgh. So, so this guy, uh, Pew, was, uh, was the, kind of the first guy to actually do this, and he, was, he was actually did it in this area. So he grew his business, uh, and uh, as I said, a lot, a lot of this was ended up in Pittsburgh, which quickly became a powerhouse of industrial activity due to the new and abundant energy supply. So, go back to this one. I want to talk about this guy here, Robert Pugh. So in 1885, oil was discovered near Lima, Ohio. So again, very close to this area. And Joseph Pugh sent his nephew, Robert Pugh, to investigate. Robert Pugh quickly acquired a couple of oil leases and formed the Sun Oil Company. And that's an important name. So at this time, Toledo had already become a very important center of the oil industry. And Robert Pugh moved to Toledo to start directing operations for his newly formed company. Um, in 1894, Sun Oil and Merriam Morgan Paraffin Company merged to form Diamond Oil, who purchased a refinery called the Crystal Oil Refinery in East Toledo. That's where Toledo refining comes in. So the refinery consisted of five people, four little wooden stills, and a couple of old boilers, and the purchase cost was one dollar, plus some other valuable considerations. So who knows what those were, but he got, he got the refinery for a dollar. And by the way, when, when the company I worked for bought it in 2011, it wasn't one dollar. <laughs> a little bit more than that. Um, so in, in 1895, as I said, Pew bought this refinery from Merriam and Morgan, uh, and they called it the Diamond Oil Refinery, uh, but he bought them out very quickly, and sole ownership went to, to Robert Pugh, and the refinery was renamed the Sun Oil Toledo Refining Company. And that was the name of the company up until 2011, so well over 100 years. Robert Pugh was named the first refinery manager. So let's get back to the presentation. There he is. So this guy on the right is me, 125 years ago. <laughs> He's better dressed and probably a little better spoken, but that's okay. Anyway, so the refinery is born. Top picture, that's the refinery he bought for a dollar. Doesn't look much, does it? There's some trees without leaves on and a few buildings. And then below that is, is the refinery in 1905. So in, in basically 10 years, that's how it grew. Uh, so in 1901, uh, there was a huge oil discovery in, in Beaumont, Texas, and the Pew brothers and, and Robert Pugh went down there to investigate. Now, they, they realized they couldn't get that oil back up to here in Toledo, uh, but thankfully there was enough oil discoveries around this area that uh, they could still supply the Toledo refinery from areas in Pennsylvania and Ohio. So the company was starting to grow, and they said, hey, we need a little bit more uh, uh, office space. What are we gonna do? And they came up with an interesting solution. So there was a house uh, very close to the, the, the refinery on Woodville Road, uh, this octagonal house. And, and Robert Pugh said, you know what? I like the look of that. That's going to be our corporate office. So that's the first Sun Oil corporate office that was located on Woodville Road in Toledo. So the company continued to grow. They quickly outgrew that and realized that they had to build new offices to house all the people that, that were coming to work there. And that's the, uh, the office they built and opened in 1918. That's the one that's still there today. So we, I think we took the little awnings off because they're, they're a little 1920-ish, right? Um, so we did modernize a little bit, but uh, that's my office is on the left. Uh, that's the building we use today. The Toledo refinery quickly became a center for research on what to do with the heavy part of, of crude oil uh, after it was distilled. And after many years of experiments and testing, the Sun Oil Company uh, began selling a material called Sun Red Lubricant and Hydrolene Asphalt. These were new products in the marketplace. They were developed here in Toledo um, in the 20s and became very, very successful. So Toledo was quickly becoming, as I said, a center for the refining industry. Um, 
Obviously, early in, in the 1900s, with, with Henry Ford ramping up and so on, uh, there was an increase in car ownership. And these new cars required fuel in the form of gasoline. And what's interesting is that up to that point, the refineries that, that uh, were, existed uh, were there to primarily make um, kerosene for lamps and so on. And gasoline was a byproduct. And then all of a sudden, there was all these cars, and they said, hey, you know, Here's a, here's a good uh, marketing ploy. Maybe we can sell this stuff and run the cars. So that's exactly what happened. And that really caused the industry to ramp up and, and become uh, a lot larger in the US. Um, in 1925, Robert Pugh died at the age of 63 after 30 years at, as the refinery manager at Toledo. So he, he did a 30-year tour of duty at this refinery. Uh, I've done two, uh, so I've got a little ways to go. <laughs> But uh, he did a great job getting that place uh, into the refinery uh, that it was prior to the Second World War. Um, so a, a guy called Harry Cameron took over, uh, and in the mid-20s, the refinery capacity was 5,000 barrels a day. And a barrel is 42 gallons. And I know I'm an engineer, so I'm, I talk jargon, right? So 5,000 barrels is about 100,000, 200,000 gallons a day. So that's the kind of capacity they had back then. Um, one thing they did that was interesting in, in 1929 was they invested in a process called the Hoodry cracking process. I am not going to bore you with the technology. Do we have any chemists in the room? No. Yeah, you're lucky. So, <laughs> one. <laughs> I will not bore you with the, chem the chemistry of this, but um, I, this is the Hoodry cracking process. Looks impressive, right? The reason this is impressive is because it takes stuff that was essentially had no value, uh, the bottom of the barrel, the, the kind of grunge, heavy stuff that, that you couldn't turn into gasoline, and it literally cracks the molecules into gasoline. That's all you need to know. That's, that's the only chemistry you need to know. But it was a game changer for the industry, right? You now, you, you take one gallon of crude oil, you'd probably get about a quarter of a gallon of gasoline out of it. With this thing, you'd get about three times that. And, and one of the very first ones was cited here in Toledo. Another interesting part of Toledo refinery is, is its impact during wartime. So um, obviously with the, the attack on Pearl Harbor, US entered World War II, and at that time Sun Oil actually had two refineries, one here in Toledo, one in Marcus Hook, Pennsylvania. And as such, uh, Sun Oil was a very critical supplier of uh, fuels for the, the, uh, the military. Um, but interestingly, one of the more important things they made was chemicals. And that occurred here at Toledo. Uh, Toledo actually built a plant called a butadiene plant. Uh, and here it is. And again, yeah, I'm not even going to go into the technology. Just a bunch of pipes, I know. Um, but the reason butadiene is important is because it is critical for the manufacture of synthetic rubber. And so if you're in wartime and you can't get access to, to natural rubber supplies, but you've got to build vehicles and you know, airplanes with wheels on them, you've got to find a, a source of, of uh, rubber from somewhere else. And Toledo supplied the majority of the butadiene that went into manufacturing synthetic rubber in the US to support the war effort. So it was a, it was a very, very significant uh, impact, and it was started here in Toledo. Um, so post-war, the Toledo refinery really started growing again. In 1948, they invested $22 million in an ex expansion project. Uh, $22 million in 1948 money is a lot, right? And this is what they built. They built something called a Hoodry flow process. It's the exact, don't panic, it's the exact same thing as the thing I just showed you that breaks things apart. It's all it does. But this one did it continuously. The other one did it in a little batch and then stopped and cleaned it up and then started again. This guy did it continuously. Um, this thing was 308 feet tall. It was the tallest thing in Toledo for many, many years. Um, I'm not sure if there's anybody here that remembers it, this structure, but this thing was here until the, the early 70s um, and was, a, a, again, one of the, the, the newest processes in the industry, and it was bought Toledo, to Toledo by the, uh, the Sun Oil Company. 
So $22 million they invested in, uh, in this cracking plant and also some other plants. And at this point, uh, the refinery could process over 70,000 barrels a day. So don't forget, I said a barrel is 42 gallons. So when you do the math, that is a lot. <laughs> in, so I told you I'm not going to be technical. In, 19, in 1953, led by the refinery manager, George Kloss, Toledo Refinery became involved in a number of civic improvement projects. There's going to be a theme here as we kind of continue through this. So he was a key member of the committee to build a Toledo public library and was a large supporter of uh, the Children's Hospital and the Heart of Hearing League, both located in Toledo, and was involved in many other charitable activities throughout the city. Not only was, he, was the Toledo Refinery a large employer and economic en engine for the area, it was now actively looking to benefit the city through th philanthropic works. Remember that. So, okay. Modern refinery emerges. This is the refinery that, that exists today and it started in the, in the, the late 60s and early 70s. So in 1960, um, Toledo Refinery witnessed another dramatic expansion under the leadership of a guy called Herb Thober, a veteran of Sun Oil, uh, and he worked at both the Marcus Hook and Toledo refineries. In 61, uh, they, they completed construction on a new propane unit. It was the largest such unit in, in the US at the time. Uh, later that year, saw the startup of a new uh, manufacturing unit making naphthalene, which is a, a chemical important to the chemical industry uh, for making paints and plastics and so on. In 66, a new project was initiated to uh, upgrade a process called alkylation, which makes high octane gasoline and aviation fuel, and so on and so on and so on. I can keep reading this, but it's really dull. Um, but it, it, it kind of gives you a sense of the pace that this facility was starting to grow at and the investment that was put in. Um, in 1968, uh, the, the then president of Sun Oil, a guy called Robert Dunlop, dedicated a new plant at the Toledo refinery called a hydrocracker. And this was a very modern piece of technology that, that did uh, exactly the same as these older processes that break these heavy molecules apart, but it did it very efficiently and so on. Uh, what's interesting here with the investment at that point was 50 million. Um, it used some of the most up-to-date technology uh, that, that was available, including one of the first IBM 1800 computers. So those of you that are into technology and computers, uh, this was one of the, like, I think the first 10 uh, that, that IBM sold into the US uh, to do uh, uh, process control and other such things. Um, the next major expansion uh, of the refinery, as I said, was in the, the early 70s, uh, and that was the removal of that very, very tall unit uh, called a Hoodry Flow unit, and it was replaced by a unit called a Fluid Cat Cracker. Same principle, does the same thing, but again, much more efficient. And uh, very nice, there's a, a picture of it right there. Uh, this is actually the tallest unit you can see at the refinery right now. Uh, this is also the unit that has the, uh, the, the um, flue gas scrub on it, has the steam coming out of the top. It's the most obvious part of the refinery when you're looking at it from, uh, from a few miles away. So in the 1980s, uh, this refinery was really solidified as a, as a world-class facility. Um, a guy called John Harron uh, was refinery manager at that point. And actually what's interesting is he was the son of a guy called John Harron, number one, I guess, um, who was a refinery manager 20 years previously. So it was a father-son thing. Um, so John Harron had grown up in Toledo uh, with his, his, uh, his dad being refinery manager and then uh, uh, took it over himself in the 80s. Uh, and under his, his leadership, again, there was some more expansion uh, most of this stuff was, was more towards um, improving the quality of the fuels the refinery make, uh, removing sulfur, uh, removing lead. That was, lead was a, a big part of gasoline production until it was outlawed uh, appropriately. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of expansion and, and work done to, uh, to take care of that. And uh, let's go back to this one. So these are the two units I actually referred to. 
uh, a cat cracker and a hydro cracker. Again, I'm not going to bore you, don't worry. But they're, to me, they're really, really exciting. So anyway. Um, so I talked about the 80s and how things expanded, but most of that was to do with uh, improving the quality of the fuels that we made. Also, a lot of the work uh, and expansion investment that was done at that time was, was actually to reduce the environmental footprint of the refinery. Typically, refineries emitted a lot of uh, uh, NOx and SOx. They're called nitrous oxide and sulfur oxides. When things are burnt, um, those things needed to be removed from the, uh, the, the stacks in the refinery. Uh, we needed to remove sulfur from the vents that, that occurred there. So most of this investment post-1980 has been to really clean up the environmental footprint of the refinery. Uh, and one thing that's, that's I'm very proud of is if you look at the Toledo refinery, uh, it, is, it employs some of the most modern, state-of-the-art uh, pollution control technologies in the world. And I've worked at one, two, three, four, five, seven refineries and this is the best one in terms of that. This is the cleanest refinery I've ever worked at. And I think that's something Toledo can be, be proud of. Um, so that kind of brings us up to, to uh, you know, the 2000s. And I've obviously paraphrased a lot of this stuff uh, because I want to get to the fun stuff in a minute. But uh, in, in 2011, a company called PBF Energy rode into town on a white horse and put a check down for this refinery here. And why did they do that? Well, they did that because the Sun Oil Company, after well over 100 years of operation, had decided to throw in the towel. They said, we're not gonna be in this business anymore. They closed the refinery in Marcus Hook, Pennsylvania. They sold a refinery in Tulsa. Uh, they sold the refinery in Philly uh, to an investment company, Carlisle Group. Uh, and then they sold a refinery here in Toledo to PBF Energy. And at that point, PBF Energy was a, a private equity funded company uh, that was started just to go find refineries that no one else wanted. And, and you know, with, with, with the kind of strategy that, hey, we see value where others don't. And if they don't see value, they're gonna sell it cheap and we get it cheap and we can run it better than they can and life's good. And that was, that was the very simple uh, kind of birth of, of the company, PBF Energy and, and our philosophy. So, I want to talk a little bit about PBF, and I know I'm running a little bit short of time, so I'll, I'll kind of scrunch this down. Um, PBF was a, a company started by five guys in an office in Connecticut uh, with a copy of QuickBooks, and that was it. And they, and they went to a couple of private equity firms, uh, one called uh, Blackstone, one called First Reserve, and they also co contacted a company in Europe called PetroPlus and said, can we have some money, please? We want to go buy refineries in the US. And they all said yes. And the company that I just mentioned in, in reverse order are the PBF that make up our company name, PetroPlus, Blackstone, First Reserve. So those are the guys that said, yeah, you know what? These guys sound pretty cool. Here's half a billion dollars. Go play with it. So we did. And we bought a refinery in Delaware uh, that was shut down. And uh, that was interesting because now we've spent, you know, three, four hundred million dollars and we're not making any money. But we knew we could. So I'd actually worked at that refinery in a, in a previous life and I came back and helped restart that facility. We then bought a refinery in New Jersey from, uh, from uh, Valero. Uh, that one was running, yay. So we had, that was a lot better option. Now we had two. And then we came to Toledo in 2011 and bought this guy here and then stopped and said, you know what? We've got three refineries in quick succession. Uh, we now need to consolidate our business, really make sure our company is, is, uh, is solid and profitable. And that's what we did. And in 2014, we said, we're good. Uh, let's go IPO the company. And we did. And we IPO'd and we got $26 a share and we gave a big chunk of money to our private equity investors and they rode off in the sunset with big bags of cash and we were left with our little business that we've been running ever since. But it was still this kind of entrepreneurial business, right? It's still the kind of, hey, five guys in an office trying to keep this company going. Uh, and we don't believe in, in bureaucracy, we don't believe in a central office, we don't have a corporate office per se, we just have a few guys uh, up in New Jersey that help us out. 
all of the decision making is done here in Toledo, which I think is great. And that's one of the reasons I love this company. So at that point, um, we went public, company successful. We said, hey, you know, let's keep going. Let's keep having some fun. So little old PBF Energy, a little company, went and knocked on the door of Exxon, who's some other little old company, and said, hey, you want to sell anything? And they did. And they sold us the refinery down in New Orleans at Chalmette, and they sold us the refinery in Torrance in Los Angeles. And now we have five. It's like, wow, someone must think we know what we're doing. And we kept going. And we just announced uh, just a few uh, months ago that we're going to buy a refinery from Shell, also up in California near San Francisco. So our company has gone from didn't exist to six refineries in a decade. And we're now the fourth largest refining company in the US. And no one's ever heard of us. And the, the, the three companies that we're behind are Marathon, ever heard of them? Down in Findlay, Valero, and P66 or Philips. So we're number four now. And, and our intent is to keep growing and get past those guys and be the biggest. That's our intent. So why am I saying all this? Well, the reason I work for PBF is because we, we have this entrepreneurial attitude and we have this sense that, hey, you know, we're, we're the little guys fighting the big guys and, and we're going to do it the right way and we're not going to be bureaucratic and we're going to you know, make decisions on a local level and we're going to do all this stuff. But also, we're going to have a company that has values and we're going to write those values down and we're going to run our business based on a set of values. And we, that's exactly what we did. Um, we actually wrote down values, and a lot of them relate to the operation of the facilities we have. You know, be safe, be reliable, uh, empower people, train people, this kind of stuff. Uh, but one of them is that we have to earn the right to operate in the communities that host us. And I, it's a long phrase, but it basically says, and I, I, this is how I kind of s sell it to folks. If you wake up in the morning, and you open your little curtains and you see an oil refinery out your window, you should probably get something out of it, right? It's, there's probably something you should get out of that. And so we really take that seriously and we really like to earn the right to operate in the communities. Um, I'm gonna flick through some of these slides. Here we go. This is just PBF stuff, I don't care about this. Let's get to the fun stuff. This is how great we are. Here's, here's how great we are as well. All right, here's the good stuff, okay. So, who's the smiling guy in the middle? I don't know who that is. Uh, anyway, so he, here's how I'm going to pull all this together and why I think Rotary is an interesting uh, group to talk to this about. So, so we have an organization called a CAP, which is a community advisory panel. And those things were put in place to allow me to go to community leaders and say, yeah, the refinery was stinky yesterday. I'm sorry, it was this, this, and this. Or yeah, we held traffic up because the train kept crossing Woodville Road. Yeah, I'm sorry. So that was the, that was the intent of this, this panel. And when I came here, I said, no way. This, this group of people is incredibly powerful. It's community leaders, it's, it's police officers, it's clergy, it's business folks, it's folks from the school system. It's a lot of people that have the ability to understand and define what a community needs and help make that possible. And as a company, we have the ability to bring those folks together and to provide resources to actually do it. And that was the key. So it was taking this thing, that, this, this group of community folks that really was there to make the company look better and say, no, let's spin that around and use it to help the community. And that's exactly what we do. And it's a great bunch of folks. Uh, we have a lot of folks on there that, that, that are um, well-known folks in East Toledo and in Oregon, and, and they do a great job. I'll give you an example of some of the things we're doing. Navarre Park is a park very close to us. Uh, we, it hasn't got a lot of love, to be honest, recently. It's in pretty bad repair. We're going to revitalize that. We've already raised about $100,000 to, to do that. Um, we've invested in the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, which is uh, promoting uh, pre-K liter literacy by providing one book to every kid that wants it every month up until kindergarten. We're supporting the Boys and Girls Club over in East Toledo. 
Um, we, we, we have a, an annual golf outing, and this year we gave them $25,000 to support their before and after school programs. Um, we actively support connecting kids to meals. Uh, this is a program, I'm sure a lot of you are aware, that, that, that are providing meals to kids that wouldn't otherwise get them. Uh, and we provide financial uh, support of that and also people. And we're also a big supporter of East Toledo Family Center. This center is literally round the corner from us, provides a lot of very, very important community uh, benefits to East Toledo. Uh, it's actually run by someone that used to work at the refinery. So uh, these are kind of the things I just wanted to talk about that, that really emphasize what we're trying to do as a company. We're successful, we're doing well, but we have a, an obligation, I believe, and others believe, to help the community that's around us. Uh, and it really aligns with our values as a company to, to do the right thing and to earn the trust and earn the right to operate in, in, the, uh, in the East Toledo, Oregon area. And these are some of the pictures they've been flashing up here, the things we've been doing. So that, that's everything I wanted to uh, talk about. Uh, and I think it's Q&A time. Is that please, right? Please, I do. All right, so feel free to ask questions. Or give me a round of applause, that's even better. How, how much of your raw supply comes through Enbridge Line 5 through the Straits of Mackinac, and what do you think about the alternatives of encasing it in a tunnel versus constructing a bypass? Oh, that's a great question. So, so, really, really interesting question. So, Enbridge Line 5 is a crude supply line that comes from Canada and ends up just north of here. And we get about half of our crude oil from this pipeline. This pipeline is about, uh, I think, 80 years old. It's, it goes underground, and then it goes under the Straits of Mackinac and down south to us. Um, it has been the, the subject of a lot of concern um, because people are concerned having an oil pipeline underwater in a very environmentally sensitive area, which I 100% agree with. I think if you were to build that kind of system today, you wouldn't do that. You'd do it, you'd do it differently. And, and so it's interesting, the, the, the uh, state of Michigan and Enbridge agreed to a project, uh, and this is under the last administration in Michigan, they agreed to a project to build a tunnel under the lakes and put the, the pipe in a tunnel. So if it did leak, no big deal. It couldn't get hit by an anchor. If it did leak, it wasn't a big deal. It was in, in this tunnel. And that sounded like a great idea to me, right? That's, that's an environmentally beneficial uh, project. So uh, the issue is, and what we're kind of alluding to here, the issue is that the new administration in Michigan said, no, we don't agree with that, and we're going to shut it down today. And they, they, they basically put a 30-day moratorium on, on operating that line, uh, which Enbridge was successful in saying, slow down, let's talk about it. We propose this environmental project at our cost, by the way, Enbridge's cost, to build this tunnel. We think that's the better option. If you shut this line down immediately, it's going to cause tremendous hardship to the folks in the Great Lakes region. You know, we supply um, well over 8 million gallons a day of fuel and this pipeline carries oil to five refineries. So do the math. You are going to have to do the math on this. Five times eight. That's how many million gallons of fuel will disappear off the marketplace uh, if they shut the line down immediately. Um, and we felt that was wrong. We agreed with the environmental side that something should be done to make this better, but we didn't agree with doing it so quickly that it would cause hardship to folks in this area, right? And by the way, we supply half the fuel oil to Detroit Metro, so you wouldn't be able to fly half the flights out of Detroit Metro either. So this seemed like a little bit of a crazy scheme. Uh, we, we actually got a lot of support from local politicians that, that agreed with us, both Democrat and Republican. Imagine that. I had, a, I had Republican Lieutenant Governor and a Democratic uh, um, congressman in the same room saying the same thing. It was fantastic. I don't know how I did it. Um, 
But yeah, we got a lot of support and we got the message out that, hey, maybe we should rethink this. And, and the state of Michigan, I think, has kind of backed off a little bit. Uh, so, so they seem to be a little more reasonable now in terms of, uh, of working through this issue. But great question. Uh, how is the uh, uh, expansion of electric vehicles and hybrids, uh, in your opinion, going to affect uh, your, you know, the company, your company and the industry? So ult ultimately, it will kill the company, which is great. <laughs> ultimately, it will be the death of refining. So, so he here's my opinion. So reducing carbon footprint is the right thing to do. Uh, reducing emissions is the right thing to do. Going to more efficient technologies is the right thing to do. Um, the problem we have, and it's not me, it's we, the problem we have is that our economy and our lifestyle and our standard of living is built on the use of fossil fuels. So if you truly want to wean yourself off those, you've got to do it gradually and you've got to have technologies come in and replace them that are, are as efficient and as useful and so on. And candidly, that technology is being slow. It has not been developed quick enough. And so there is still a need for a fossil like me to run a refinery um, and, and keep people with gas in their tanks. It's gonna, it's gonna change. I doubt it's gonna change in our lifetime, but it will probably change in my kids' lifetime and probably certainly their kids' lifetime. Um, I can think of technologies that, that, are, that are probably more environmentally benign, but until there's a will to kind of move towards that, then companies like mine are going to exist and make the products we do until some, uh, some entity, whether it be government or whatever, says, you know what, we probably ought to move to something else. Um, one, one thing I do think uh, that's interesting about our, co our company is we call PBF energy. We're not called PBF petroleum or, or PBF refining. We're called PBF energy. And if there's a, uh, uh, an alternate energy um, technology that, that is ripe for the market and is, is a good technology and has promise, we're all over it. And we are looking at those things in California right now, actually. So, good question. I make this brief. I'm an organic chemist, so I always thought it was Howdry, not Hoodry. But be that as it may, I'm an American, yeah. don't speak English I, anyway. Yeah, uh, I, I, have, I have a lot. That, I can't say the word banana. I've been here 25 years, and I still can't say it with anyway. All so, right, well, you can answer this question. Yeah, that okay. is, what kind of protection does the refinery have in this day of, of heightened interest and in worrying about all sorts of things in terms of safety? Yeah, that's. That's, and I think you're talking about safety from outside in, right? Yeah. So that, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, we refineries are having, have risk associated them with it. They contain a lot of flammable materials, a lot of chemicals that, that are potentially toxic. And so yeah, that has to be managed correctly, and it is. So I, I get visited by Department of Homeland Security uh, every so often, those nice folks come in and say, hey, are you doing what you're supposed to do? Are you taking care of this plant? Do you have the right security measures in place, the right physical barriers, the right uh, uh, monitoring of, of entrances, the right um, uh, uh, access controls, and so on and so on and so forth. And there is a book this big that defines what we as, a, as an industry has to do to make sure our, our plants stay safe and don't aren't the uh, um, don't get impacted by a, a terrorist threat or something else. So, so there, there's a lot of regs around that, and, and we take it very seriously. I often say our refinery is like a little town. We have our own security service, right? That we have folks there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, monitoring the, the 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 refinery, making sure uh, we control who goes in and out. And by the way. No one in this room can get in there um, without certain authorizations. And uh, it's not somewhere where you can just walk in. Um, and, uh, and we take that very seriously. So yeah, and, and, and again, Homeland Security takes it very seriously too. And, uh, and they come see us and make sure we're behaving about every three months. So really good question. OK. Thank you. Thanks,
Mike, that was a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. I had no idea what the history was. I really enjoyed that. In um, recompense for you joining us and, and your hard work today, uh, we would like to uh, offer you two things. One is historical tales of Toledo. Thank you. I think you might find that interesting. And we will make a contribution in your name to our International Polio Plus Fund. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Next week, we're going to have a very good meeting. It's a joint meeting with the Mommy Rotary Club. The subject is going to be human trafficking. It's going to be filled next week, so you might want to think about coming early. And there is one meeting today that's with membership development in the North Cape Room. And Chuck Mann, where are you? On New Year's Eve, the owner stood up in a local pub and said that it was time to get ready. At the stroke of midnight, she wanted everyone to be standing next to the one person who made their life worth living. Well, it was kind of embarrassing as the clock struck, the bartender was almost crushed to death. Uh, my New Year's resolution is to stop procrastinating, and I plan to start it first thing next week. Uh, this new year, I resolved to be less sarcastic. Yeah, right. Uh, I joined a health club last year, spent about 400 bucks. Haven't lost a pound. Apparently, you have to go there. Thank you, Chuck. We are adjourned. Thank you. Know this is yes, I did. Oh, okay.